to have your Bibles, please open to Colossians chapter number 2. Colossians chapter number 2, your Bibles this morning. We want to look to the Word of God for His instruction, for His help, and for His guidance. Our theme of this year is Rooted in Him. My prayer for this church is that God would grow this church this year. It doesn't just mean numerically, though I believe that that is one way that God grows the church by new people, trusting him as their savior, growing, becoming a part of a local church. But I'm also praying that God would grow this church, meaning that everyone who's a part of this church would be grown spiritually. That there would be great spiritual growth this year as well. I don't just want new souls, and I don't just want spiritual growth. I want God to grow the church. I'm praying that he will do that, and I believe that he will. God wants to grow his church. You know that? He gave the promise to Peter, or he gave it to Peter. He said, upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. God's plan is that nothing stops his church. God's power means that nothing will stop his church. Now, there's a universal sense that nothing will stop God, but there's a very practical sense that you and I, you and I can resist, the Bible says, the Holy One. For whatever reason, in God's power and his sovereignty, he gave humans the ability to resist him. Now, not resist in the sense that we can alter the course of nature. God alone controls those things. But he gave us the will that we can, if we so dangerously choose, to say no to him. There are many people in this world who say no to God who don't embrace his love and trust his sacrifice. There are many who say no to him, who deny that he made everything, who resist the fact that God is in charge, ruler over all, and God, for whatever reason, his sovereignty and power allows those things to go on. In fact, Jesus Christ, in a moment of a compassion and sorrow stood looking over uh, the, the city of Jerusalem and said, he said, how often I would have gathered you like a hen gathereth her chicks. He said, I wanted you to bring you close to me. I wanted to, to cover you with my protection and my help and my sustenance. But, the Bible says, he says of those Jewish people, you would not, you would not. I'm afraid, my friends, as Christians, even those who've trusted Jesus Christ, there are times in our life, unfortunately, that we dangerously choose to resist God himself. And my prayer this year is that we would grow in our spiritual walk with God. A simple yet profound concept. One of those things that we often will say about life, easier, help me here if you know it, easier said than done. We all had excuses why we're not as close to God as we ought to be. We have excuses. Well, you don't know how busy my life is as opposed to everyone else. You don't know the burdens that I have in my life. You don't understand the, the, the way that, that I was treated when I was younger. We all have excuses. But this year, my challenge is that we'll be rooted in him, rooted in Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 2, beginning verse number 6. The Bible says, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him who is head of all principality and power. We can't let's go, Lord, in prayer this morning. Lord, I need you this morning, and we need you. I'd ask that during this service that you would illuminate your word to us. Lord, I pray for help for myself as I speak, that I would say those things that would be true and accurate to your word, and nothing I say would hinder the message of truth here. Lord, I need your help and clarity 
to articulate these truths. But Lord, without you, I can do nothing. And without you, we can do nothing. And Lord, I would shudder to think that we'd have a service without you present. I pray that you'd, you would among us work, change us, touch us. That everything that you desire to accomplish in lives here this morning would be accomplished. That we'd be obedient. We would not resist you. In Jesus' name I pray and, and thank and ask. Amen. I mentioned last week when I began kind of launching the theme that we live in a postmodern culture. In fact, last week I placed a, a picture on the screen that some of you have commented on. Like, well, I really enjoyed modern art. Well, fooey on all of you who enjoy modern art. My point being that in modern art and modern culture, we leave a lot of things up to our own interpretation. Our own feelings, our own perspective, our own take on the situation. Well, what I feel, what I think, what I experience, what I notice, thinking and, and, and thereby saying those things, that because we have put ourselves at the front of that statement, thereby we are now an authority on this. That somehow in the grand scheme of things, my feelings really matter. When in reality, in the grand scheme of life, my feelings, to be honest, don't matter. They're just feelings. You know, feelings can be wrong. Did you know that? Do you ever feel badly in the morning and still have to go to work? Yes or no? Tomorrow's Monday. Many of you will not feel great, but you'll wake up, you go to work. You ever, those of you who have children, you ever have your children who don't feel like doing something? Hey, clean your room. Well, Dad, I don't feel like it. Oh, my bad. Well, then don't clean your room. Because your feelings are important to me, and if you don't feel like it, you shouldn't have to. But my friends, that's how many of us live. Rather than understanding that truth is connected to God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is, there is a firm foundation of truth, and it is found in God himself. This is the truth that I'm presenting to us through the word of God. There is a desire in churches. That churches should be formed after our interpretation and our feeling. You know, wow, you know, we maybe shouldn't have such long services. Let's make them shorter. We shouldn't have so many services. Let's have less services. And rather, rather than look, what does God have for us? We determine our own desire, interpretation, and feeling. Because of this, we end up with weak minds spiritually. Small in our thoughts, our relationships I mean, our human relationships, they're barren. They're barren. They feel empty. You see people going from relationship to relationship looking for some satisfaction and fulfillment, not realizing that because they've structured them after themselves, they will only find dissatisfaction and unfulfillment. You become anemic in our character. You do realize that it's hard to find people who want to work. You realize this? You've seen stores that are closed because they just can't get people to come to work. Some of you own businesses here in the church, and you've mentioned to me how people will set up interviews and they won't even show up. They may set up the interviews just so they can maintain governmental supplemental benefits. And they don't show up. Anemic in our character. It goes beyond that. You go to the store and try to ask them to hold on to a warranty claim. And guess what you find out? The character is anemic. We become frail in our spiritual walk and understanding and faith with our God. And we live in such a self-centered culture where life seems to revolve around me. In a sense, people live, and, and we're guilty of it as well, where we live like we're the center of the universe and the sun and the earth and the moon and the stars all revolve around me. Maybe you've met someone who really accentuates this concept. They're annoying to be around, are they not? You try to say something and they immediately interject with their own better version, story, or situation. It's been around since, since the beginning of time. You realize that selfishness and, and self-fullness. You begin to tell a story about fish and they interrupt your story and say, Yeah, well, let me tell you about the fish that I caught. You're like, well, I didn't really care about that fish you caught. I want to talk about the fish I caught because at that moment, we want the world to revolve around us. 
We see it in culture. We want what we want, and no one should tell me otherwise. So no one should deny me, thereby we have theft. Because, man, you have something I want, and I can't afford it. That doesn't matter. I want it, and because it revolves around me, I'll go take it. No one should restrain me or tell me, no, we have lawlessness. Oh, but it's so more insidious than that. No one should have to put up with that person, so we have divorce. In fact, Jesus said, from, because of the hardness of your hearts. It's even deeper than that. No one should not be allowed to make their own choice, so we have abortion. Understand this concept of selffulness, full of self, all right, creeps its way into every aspect of life. Every part of life, and, and we are called, you and I as Christians are called to reject that and to not be full of self. You see, cultural norms aren't to be trusted. You realize that, that a society that's, a, that's a focused on self cannot be trusted as well throughout history. There are societies that believed in annihilating other societies. There, there, were, there were people that believed in selling other human beings. Society accepted this. It doesn't make it right just because society said it was okay. Even now we have societies that stomp all over human rights. The, the longer we go, the, lo the more we understand that there must be something besides my own take on life. Or if we're really selfish, we say there must be something besides your own take on life, so take my take on life. And this is where we're at in current culture, is it not? Don't tell me no. But the greatest sin in our society is telling someone else that they're wrong. That's an, or intolerance. Acceptance, boy, I accept everyone, everyone else's ideas as truth. Boy, that's, that's great, and I'm just, I, I am woke. But if I begin to bring something that is a, a level, a metric for truth, if I begin to say, no, there is, there is actual truth, and that means there is right and there is wrong, now I'm guilty of hate speech. You see, this focus on self infiltrates every part of a life. Long introduction for a simple, short message. Look, say, or, or Colossians chapter number two. Because when we focus and center life around ourselves, we will head toward corruption and destruction. But just one verse today we're going to look at. Verse number six. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. He's talking, first part of this verse, to those who have received him. Those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. This message is those who are Christians today. Those who have realized that they're, without Jesus Christ, going to a devil's hell. That we are guilty before a holy God. That all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that the verse says, as, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. He's talking about those who have received him in salvation. Those who have put their faith, their trust in Jesus Christ for the hope of eternal life. They've received him. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And if you're here this morning and you've never trusted in Jesus Christ for salvation, I pray, I hope, my prayer is that today, today, you and your heart will put your faith in Jesus Christ. It's not in the church we attend. It's not in religion we hold on to. It is a simple fact that I put simple faith in Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus Christ. You say, Pastor, what does it mean to believe in Jesus Christ? Well, I like to say it means simply three things to believe in Jesus Christ. It means to believe, first of all, that he is who he says that he is. You know, Jesus Christ claims in Scripture to be God. Before Abraham was, I am. 
The Bible says there, the Jews there went to stone him. They went to stone him because that was a sacred name reserved for God himself. And Jesus said, I am Jehovah. I am the great I am. And he is. He is. To believe in Jesus is to believe not that he's just a good teacher, not that he's a brother of the devil, not that he's just one of the son of God, but that he is the only begotten son of God. So to believe in Jesus is, first of all, to believe that he is who he says he is. To believe in Jesus is to believe that he did what he says that he did. He said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. How did he seek? Well, he he sought them by coming, by ministering, by giving his word. He saved them by dying on the cross for the payment of the sins of mankind. All right, for by one man sin entered the world and death by sin. That was Adam. But one man by one man, salvation comes. That's by Jesus Christ. So to believe in Jesus is to believe that he is who he says he is and that he did what he says he did. He not only says he came to save, he said that I'll be buried, that the Son of Man will be buried three days and will rise again. And three days later, just like Scripture said, he rose again from the dead. It's not enough just to say, well, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. If he didn't rise from the dead, Paul argues in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if he didn't rise, the resurrection, we are of all men most miserable. All right, so Jesus Christ literally lived on earth. He literally died. He was literally buried, and he literally rose again. They went to the tomb that Sunday morning, and Jesus was gone. Then he showed back up to Mary in the form of a transform. And all that was the story. So to believe in Jesus is to believe that he is who he says he is, to believe that he did what he says he did, and to believe in Jesus is to believe that he will do what he says he will do. And this is what that is. It's so simple. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. To believe in Jesus is to believe that if I ask him to save me, he will save me. That if I trust in him, he will do just that. Have you ever had anyone pull a prank on you? I have. I've also pulled some pranks on on people. Right? My wife says, indeed, honey, hush, not yet, not yet, honey. (laughs) No, she knows that. So I can be a prankster. And we don't like to really be tricked, but sometimes pranks can be kind of, kind of humorous and fun. You know that Jesus Christ has never pulled a prank in this regard on anyone? He's never done the bait and switch like an insurance company. He's never offered one thing and give another bill of sale. My friends, if you ask Jesus Christ to save you, he will do just that. And so if you've never believed in Jesus, my friend, I pray that today will be the day that you put your faith in Jesus, to believe he is who he says he is. That he did what he says he would do and that he will do what he says he will do. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. That's the message for today. Colossians chapter 2 verse 6. So if you've accepted Jesus Christ, he gives this little simple command. So walk ye in him. So simple, just a few words, yet it ought to be our life goal for the rest of our life. I want to preach on this little concept, abiding in Jesus, walking in Jesus. I'm not going to get through the whole message today. I wrote this message, and when I got to the end of it, I realized that if I tried to do all the day, we would be here till tonight. So I'll break it up into three easy parts, one this week and the next two weeks. Lord willing. But I want to give you just one of these concepts that I think will be helpful to you, because the question is, well, how do we abide in Jesus? Maybe you've heard that before. How do we abide in him? Well, what's the the theological definition? And my friends, there are people in this room who are much smarter than me, who can articulate things much better than me. But today I'd like to give you just one simple way that we know how we can abide in Jesus. Because I like simple things. Break it down. And I think this will be a help to you and a blessing to you. Let me give you just this first point today. All right, it'll be a whole sermon. Here it is. To walk in him. To walk in him means to stay close to him. Can you figure that out so far? To walk in him, to abide in Jesus, means to to stay close to him. Now, you see, my wife's down here in the front row, and I will reference her a few times today, because the, the word, the one word for this sermon would be relationship. If you want to abide in Jesus, you have to have a relationship with Jesus. And my wife and I are going on a walk, and I say, honey, let's go on a walk, and she's over there, and I'm over here. We may be walking similarly, But we're not walking together. 
Can you understand that so far? Are you, are you with me so far? Right? In order for me to go on a walk with my wife, I would go to where she is at, you with me so far, and walk with her or be close to her. And if you want to abide in Jesus Christ, you need to walk with Jesus and be close to him. Here it is. Here's a phrase. It means I communicate with God and he communicates with me. It means I communicate with God and he communicates with me. How does God communicate with me? Well, God communicates with me through his word. You see, we must have a relationship. We live in a time when, when, when people are religious, but they have no relationship with God. When people go to church and they sing songs, but they don't have a relationship with God. They, they do good deeds and they, they put money in the plate, but they don't have a relationship with God. They, they check off all the boxes, of the, the, the church boxes. They smile and they nod and they, and they greet, but there's no relationship. God does not want us just to pay our bills and not cheat on our taxes and provide for our families. Though God does want those things, that's not all he wants. What God desires is not just that we care about our neighbors, but that we have a relationship with him. It means that I communicate with him and he communicates with me. How does God speak to me? Through the word of God. Gave out at the beginning of the year those little books Rooted in the Word. I hope they've been a help to you. Many of you have, have texted me or give me some, some thoughts and you've been grateful for those things. Listen, if you can get in the Word of God, my friends, if you get in the Word of God, you will have a relationship with God. I promise you, this will, Word will bring you close to God, all right, or you'll have to move away from God and set it down. But if you stay in the Word, you will become close to God. He communicates. He communicates. Clear truths in Scripture. The Holy Spirit guides me into all truth. And he communicates with me. Are you a good listener? I don't mean in, a, in your marriage or your relationship or parent or at school. Like, oh, so and so. But are you a good listener with God? Can God communicate with you and you actually pay attention if you've been saved you'll understand this if not i hope you get saved today but have you ever felt convicted from god about something perhaps you said something you shouldn't say and not just guilt though guilt's part of it you you feel badly on the inside you're like oh i shouldn't have said that perhaps you did something you shouldn't do perhaps you stole something and inside when you stole it you thought ah oh, I shouldn't do that. God was speaking to you about a wrong action. We call that conviction from God. Sometimes it'll happen at a camp or at a church service, right, Brother Swain? And you'll see young people come at invitation time, and, and they're under conviction, we call it. Sometimes those moments, somebody's stomach will feel kind of like, ugh, all right? And their hands could be sweaty as they feel like God's really speaking to them. You know that those things can also happen just in life? You know, my stomach can feel, uh, if I eat mayonnaise that's been left outside for two days. You know, my hands get sweaty if I run 30 feet. What's the difference? If I'm at church service or I've done something wrong, like feel that feeling, that conviction, I don't think, boy, did I just got done running? Did I have bad? No, no. I knew it was the voice of God speaking to me. My friends, if I'm going to be close to God, I've got to listen to the voice of God through his word, through preaching, through godly friends. There are times when God wants us to be generous. Maybe you felt this before and you knew the offering came or somebody had a need. You're like, oh, I need to give. And you obeyed. You're so glad because you listened to God. To be close to God means that he communicates with me and that I communicate with him. Month of November, we spent time on prayer. I had a little answer to prayer. Well, I should have a full answer tomorrow. And by the way, we're praying for our housing ministry, and I should know that answer on Tuesday morning. I should pray toward that end, and I can't wait when God answers that prayer to tell you the whole story. All right, it's a great story. But when the hand of God works, it's always a good story. But this past week, our oven went on the fritz. 
We moved into this house. They had a big place for a double oven. Now, I didn't think I needed a double oven. Doreen didn't think we needed a double oven. But after having a double oven, we needed a double, a double oven. Okay, it's one of those things in life. I'm telling you right now. We had, when we bought the house, the Lord had graciously provided a very expensive double oven at a fraction of the cost. In fact, our oven in our house, brand new, was over $3,000. We did not pay nearly that. And because of that, part of it didn't work. Well, a screen on it. And this past week, the screen went out again on it. And, and when it does that, it just turns off. So the food's in the oven. And if it turns off, boom, it's gone. My wife's like, can we get this thing fixed? Well, I've already done this. So I said, Lord, I need to figure this out. Well, I went on Facebook Marketplace this past week. And I found an oven that's identical to my oven, but it's brand new. Except it's missing a door. Well, I have two doors on my double oven. And they were asking just a fraction, I'm talking a fraction, a fraction of the cost of a new one. So I messaged the guy and said, hey, you know, I'm interested. Silence. Crickets. I'm like, all right. I'm praying to the Lord, if this is the right oven, this would be, be really neat. You know, and I could see, see the hand of God in it. And so I prayed and I put it aside. About to go to bed that night, all of a sudden my phone dings, ding, Facebook Messenger. I'm cautiously optimistic. Sure enough, it was this guy. Yeah, I've got this oven. And I instantly offered less. It was a fraction, but I wanted a fraction of a fraction. It's just the way I roll in life. Just, and uh, he countered back with another number that was still under his first number. I said, this is good. Then, radio silence. It was Thursday night. Friday came around. Friday morning, I get up and said, hey, you know, I'm supposed to go there Saturday. Yesterday, I'm supposed to go there. I said, hey, you still okay for Saturday? Nothing. 9.30 in the morning, it was noon, nothing. At noon, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, I sent another message. Hey, trying to line up a, a truck to get down there? Nothing. And now I'm like, Lord, I'm praying for this thing. I need you to do this. Like, there's, I can't, I don't know where he lives. I can't drive to his house. All right? And, you know, my wife wants another oven, and I want her to have one. <laughs> I like to eat. I'm praying. I said, Lord, can you, can you make this happen? Still nothing. So I'm driving home from work. Friday night, I'm like, Lord, all right, Lord, if, if, this, if that's your plan, you have something else better. Or this is your problem, not my problem. But, Lord, I need, I'm communicating with him. Well, somebody called me about 5.30 Friday night. Hey, how's that guy with the oven? I'm like, radio silence. They're like, are you kidding? That happens on Facebook. I'm like, hey, the Lord knows. Went to bed. Saturday morning, wake up. Guess what I had in my phone? A message from this guy. And he said, I am so sorry I had a wedding yesterday. A likely story. <laughs> and then he said, listen, two people have come to see it. They've both walked away. Are you sure you want this oven? Yeah, now, maybe a little less now. I'm going tomorrow, Lord, willing to go pick up this oven. All right, not because I'm special. Because I serve a special God. Listen, my friends, if you want to abide in Jesus Christ. It means you need to stay close to him. He communicates with me, and I communicate with him. I didn't use the word talk. He talks to me, I talk to him. Because, because, and those of you who have been in a relationship understand this, there are times that you don't need to even talk. My wife's down there. Usually before I sing a song, I'll look right at my wife and she'll smile at me. Sometimes she winks at me. That says it all. Right? Those little nuances of being close to somebody. Those little touches. Sometimes all we need from God is, if I can, a spiritual hug. Don't need to say anything. That's being close to God. I'll give me three thoughts and I'll be done this morning. Three quick thoughts. When you're close... Understand that small suggestions become large concerns. What do I mean by this? Let me remind you of a story in the Bible. David was king. He had three men that were very close to him. And David muttered something, almost under his breath. He said, oh, I'd love a cup of water. I'd love some water from that well in Bethlehem. And these three mighty men said, our king wants a cup of water. Well, let's go get it. And they go through and they kill a slew of Philistines for a cup of water. I have no doubt in my mind they were proud of themselves. <laughs> I 
And I have no doubt that no one's going to stop them from that water. He said, you know what? Our king wants a cup of water. We're going. We're going. And we don't care if there's 50 billion Philistines. We're coming back with water for King David. They bring him back to King David. And David says, I can't drink this. You put your life in line for water. But isn't that how a relationship goes? When you love someone, you're close to them. You say, oh, that'd be nice. And all of a sudden you're like, that's what I want to do. When you're close to the Lord, small suggestions become large concerns. You don't have to wait for the preaching to make you move and follow God. He influences you through his word about being kind or generous. And all of a sudden you're like, small suggestions. His small suggestion becomes a large concern. And this once, my mother-in-law, who I love, and she may be watching this morning, we were out there one time, and, and uh, she does some special things. And one time I mentioned how much I enjoyed these croutons she had. I think they were Marie Callender's ranch-flavored croutons. This was years ago. Somehow she heard me mutter that. And about every time I've gone out there, she'll have these few bags of ranch-flavored croutons. My friends, you know the Lord wants us to serve him and follow him? And I don't think the Lord wants to have to shout at us to give us instruction. Can you just make a small suggestion in your life and my life? When you're close to someone, small suggestions become large concerns. Number two, small impressions become clear communication. A touch, a nod, a squeeze can say everything. It can say everything. I mentioned this morning a little bit about having Brother Swain with us, and how he wasn't supposed to be here. I didn't tell you the full story this morning in Sunday school. But we had a, I had a, a, a man and his wife who were supposed to be here today for church and then for Sunday school, and uh, scheduled them months back. And they had a death in the family or connected with them, uh, uh, some extended member of the family, so we had to cancel. I'm like, boy, well, this is the month of January. It's revival month here at First Baptist Church, and what am I going to do? When I found out that Brother Swain was going to come up here, I thought this would be great for us. All right? Small impressions, clear communication. But he's going to come up the ninth, last Sunday. Or not the ninth, it was the eighth last Sunday, right? The eighth. And I'm thinking in my mind, well, that doesn't work. I need him on the 15th in the morning. And then he wasn't, he wasn't in a place to drive last week. So he said, he I called, he said, I'm not coming this Sunday. I've got to come next Sunday, the 15th. I'm like, Lord, this is exactly right. Then he said, yeah, but just so you know, I'm not going to make it. Uh, he said, I'm going to stop and I'll come for the evening service. I'm like, oh, that doesn't work. I said, Brother Swain, I said, think about this. Would you come? I'd like you to speak Sunday morning. And sure, if you're here this morning, you know that was exactly what God wanted for us. When you're close to the Lord, small impressions become clear communication. And number three, small movements become easily discernible. When you sit next to somebody and they're sitting right next to your arm, if they move, you feel it. Right? When you're close to the Lord, I want to be where he is at. Don't you? And if he's moving, I want to be right with him. You see out there, and I'm up here, you can move all over the place, and I would see you if you begin to walk out of here. But you could move your leg, and I wouldn't know. You can move your hand, I wouldn't know. But if I'm next to you, I know that. You see, to abide in Jesus means to stay close to him. How close are you to Jesus Christ today? And not how much do you claim to be. You can fool me. You can fool your, your family. You can't fool God. He knows if you're close to him. He knows if he can just nudge you and you'll respond. He knows. He knows if his small suggestions become large concerns in your life. I read a story about a, a pastor, an old Irish pastor. He saw a peddler. The peddler was selling wares, objects from door to door. He greeted the man. He said to this, this peddler, he said, it's a grand thing to be saved. And the peddler said, eh, but I know something better than that. Now, this pastor was all geared up for an argument, all geared up for a fight. Better than being saved? What can you possibly know better than that? And this old peddler with a lot of wisdom said this, the companionship of the one who saved me as well. You want to abide in Jesus? Be close to him. If you're not close, get close to him. Get close to him. If you're not saved,
trust in you.